I was so struck this time, I've seen it three times now, uh, but I was so struck by the beautiful editing that's done <laughs> for the film and how, uh, I mean, you did it in two years um, and there was something so uh, immediate about it and yet so timeless and I just loved all of the nature that mixed in with the, 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 the home, which is such a beautiful home. But the thing that shocked me about it was when we talked to you earlier and I said to you, it felt like you just went in with a camera and just shot something that was happening all the time just there. That it was almost like you were just recording, not just, but you were recording an event. But all of it is 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 pre pre premeditated and staged and everything, and yet it has this kind of a um, naturalism and reality that makes you just want to be hanging out with all these people. <laughs> Did you feel that way? <laughs> and 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 yet, and and it's so moving, obviously for for a lot of reasons, but. What made you want to make this film? Well, I'd, it's probably no accident that it was f around three years after my mother had died. So death was on my mind. Um, and, it, you know, she was 88. It was a good long life. It was not a painful one. Um, and she, I mean, I, don't, I made an earlier dance actually for and about my mother's death. This is not that so much, but it made me think about you know, what a long-lived life means. And in my mother's case, and in this character's, it helped to be surrounded by younger people. My mothers were not so much younger and not necessarily so pretty and such good dancers, but <laughs> she, you know, it, it helped that as she was moving on, other people were there. She was losing friends, of course, as is any 80-something-year-old, but she was also surrounded by people who loved her. So I guess that was the initial inspiration. I can't, you know, I don't really know where these come from. But once they get rolling, they get rolling. Well, that's what it feels like. It feels very, spon it, it feels spontaneous. Um, it feels uh, that, that there's so much love there uh, for everybody. Everybody, babies, older people, you know, uh, everybody has a tremendous amount of, of warmth and love. You know, I think it's more spontaneous than you would ever imagine. And <laughs> Charles and Cal and Deborah, you know, everybody involved in it could talk about how true that is. On the other hand, I've been making dances a long time and often with these same people. So we have a shorthand. It doesn't take much to get something going. In, we didn't have like long hours of rehearsal. Right. I think that when Deborah and her daughter arrived, we had one rehearsal the day before outside for 45 minutes because Maya didn't have much time from purchase. The dance that everybody does um, when they say goodbye in the window to Eileen. I mean, it's not a highly choreographed event. That one, I think we had about 20 minutes under the, where the fire is because it was raining. And we, you know, kind of imagined it and marked it. And it's to the dancer's credit and to our long history that something can be thrown together so quickly and then they don't look like it's, they look like it's natural, but not, not too contrived, not too cash. And that's, um, that's what I'm aiming for and they know I'm aiming for it and those who don't know, learn quickly. <laughs> But that they're that, not going to get a lot of practice. And that's the, the spontaneity, and, and it's not one of these things where you certainly think, oh, now they're going to do a dance number. Oh, now we're going to do a thing. Because it all just sort of flows sort of beautifully between the, the, the sort of that's conceived... The yeah, yeah, that's the goal. Yeah, the conceived notions of it and then the, the more um, uh, narrative elements to it. And when we were talking earlier, I was very impressed with the idea, first of all, that you are the editor. Um, and that you oftentimes will take the film after the fact and sort of edit the choreography, uh, you know, in, in post, as it were, as opposed to making everybody do everything the way you want it up front. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking watching it tonight that 
when I, so I'm the choreographer. I mean, at the, because the choreography happens about two minutes before the shooting, uh, you can't quite differentiate choreographer from director. And that's true in live work too, that you're directing the action and the acting at the same time as you're making it all up. But once that's over, I'm really not the choreographer anymore. I don't care who told those people to do what. <laughs> I'm looking at you know, how, it, how the camera now makes that choreography come alive in the frame. And it's really easy for me to go, the hell with the choreography as it was intended. And it was never intended to be, you know, four counts of, 32 counts of four anyway. So it's very easy to allow it to have whatever life it needs in terms of narrative or flow uh, or who appears when or, or I was thinking watching tonight, a lot of, Eileen is so lovely, the expressions she gives with so, little direction from me. Uh, and it's so easy to cut her thoughts in and out and have her reflection mean so much more than any old choreography could. And tell us a little bit more about Eileen. She, her name is Eileen Pasloff and she's 86 this year. She taught at Bard College for 46 years where she was the mentor of Arthur, the shaved head guy who is her beloved, I mean, <laughs> her beloved student, um, and I met, I knew Arthur, we had worked together a lot, and I met her through him when I made a short documentary called Arthur and Eileen about their relationship. Um, so I didn't know her well, but I knew her enough to know that she would be comfortable being the center of attention, but she wouldn't be a diva. Um, and that she is natural and zoftig, which was the heroine I wanted. Um, <laughs> What else can I tell you about her? She sadly is, has cancer now. She was not sick when we were shooting this. She has pneumonia tonight as well. Otherwise, she sends her love and would be here. <clears throat> um, she's like the, the Eileen late in the movie. She says she's pretty content in her cool apartment in New York that has a Murphy bed and everything she needs right near her. And her dog, the little dog that Arthur brings is really hers. And uh, her visitors, mentees, friends who come by. She's a great dame. So they come and go just in, a, in the sense, the yeah. way you see it up there, in, but in a different context. Yeah. And, and what about this house? <laughs> this amazing this house. house. <laughs> and, you, and it's fun to show it in Rockland, because I realize you, you, know, you probably figure that's Clausland Mountain, even if you don't know which corner it is. You know that's our Hudson. Uh, I was thinking of Bob Steen, we were running, uh, not right by your house, but well, we were running up the hill from Honey and ba where you guys lived, and we were, uh, that she also jogs on Midland, you know, you probably recognize, anyway, all those places you recognize. This little house that you probably don't see is part of the, what was the Ben Hecht estate. Oh, There's a very cool writing house on the river, which you see, she walks up to it at night, that little kind of pie-shaped house, and this other house, which is too darn tiny to shoot in, uh, is a caretaker's cottage. Design, I mean, I put stuff in the shelves, but the design of the house, the art director in Christie is just <laughs> salivating. I did, I have to say, I just wanna move in. But, uh, it, and so that was my next question. So you brought all of those wonderful toys and props, mm -hmm. and, and what about the dollhouse? The dollhouse, you know, the, the dollhouse appeared at the thrift shop, which I frequent regularly, for 15 bucks, thank you very much. And nobody really wanted it when it was over, so it went right back to the thrift shop. And it's probably sold again. It just, it called to me because it was a great toy. And then I love how, I mean, if I may pat myself on the back, I love that it's the house within the house. And then when the woman goes to that house, illegally, I might add, out in the world, that it's also that house. So there's, you know, magic houses within houses. Yeah, I love that panning shot where you start on the real windows and then suddenly you move in and then suddenly you realize you're actually in the, in the little house uh, right there. I mean, and, and in terms of your, oh, sorry. Uh, in terms of the, the camera work, um, were you, did you, how did you see it as it was being filmed? Do you mean, for example, was there a monitor that yeah. I could look at? Yeah. 
uh, with Cal most of the time, with Charles almost never, with the drone uh, between shots. Um, so how did you how did you talk about the shot the shooting of it? Was there a <laughs> dialogue, or did you just sort of let it go, or how did how did you do well, that? Well, you know the other camera that I didn't mention that has the smudged thumb on it is Jim Desmond, who is also in it. You know he is, he also has a history with candid camera, which I love and I'd like for you to know now. Uh, but I it was fun for me that there was one camera that, however spontaneous and random his footage was, it would add a, what maybe didn't need to be added because an awful lot of the direction, right, Cal, was, Where's okay, Cal? we're gonna, there's Cal in the back. Cal. Was, okay, we're gonna have this party and please, you know, get what you can. And some, and it's okay if Jim is also in the shot. In fact, it's good. The, the performers can address Jim's camera directly, but not yours. You know, we would sometimes say, how about being low so that we see mostly food? It was important that Eileen be the center, but there was not a whole lot of careful framing. Um, obviously, Cal did as much as he could for my benefit, but we, it was uh, all fly by the seat of our pants. Am I wrong? I think that one of the differences, but even still, that was so much an obvious setup that I guess speaks for itself, is when Eileen does her solos directly to the camera. Um, obviously, those were head on, and she was the one who made decisions about, she choreographed that herself, essentially, and we just talked about what height things should be and what should be in the background. So there were all the cameras were running at once? No. No. There was, there, at this party at the end, there were two cameras, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we're in her bedroom. Charles, and, and there was Jim too, but we didn't end up using that. Um, mostly it was one camera at a time, and there's a camera person not here tonight mm -hmm. who did the woods and the snow and, and the nighttime outdoor party. Uh, but no, there were only oh. two cameras. I mean, it's too small a place to have two cameras most right. of the time, the, right. especially indoors. Right. And often I would use one cameraman because the other wasn't available, because this took place between October and April. So it sort of depended upon who was, who available, was available when. Yeah, I was gonna talk about the seasons because it's a beautiful sort of evolution through the snow and then the spring and then, and, and, and nature in general uh, and the river and the sand and the dancing in the sand, which uh, is, is just so beautiful and so, so remarkable. And so the themes, are there themes inside it? Or is there any, um, how do I want to say this? In terms of just um, co uh, covering what was happening, were there things that you wanted to focus on necessarily? Or were you just sort of wanting to just pick up whatever you could? Were there things you wanted to focus on? Well, yeah, the, I mean, the connection between people, and that's in the choreography. Right. Um, and in the, I guess just the, that even when there's a soloist, like even when the guy is in the woods, there's a sense that he came from having talked to her or he will go talk to her again. So I guess it's that, um, it's, the main theme is there's life and death. Right. And the passage of time. Right. Uh, and community. Community, I thought that was very powerful. The, the people would be there, that they come back and then the handing of the gifts towards the end. I was very moved by that this time, very moved. I just thought, you know, it's all, you know, as we get older, you know, it's, it's wonderful to have that kind of image of when you start to want to do that yeah. sort of thing, to have <laughs> those kind of people around who are all, all there. And to let stuff go, you know, yeah. to give the stuff that meant something between the two of you to give it away. And what about the nurse? <laughs> uh, the nurse. The nurse is Aislinn McMaster, who's worked with me a bunch, is a fabulous human being and a beautiful dancer who then became a nurse, a real nurse. Uh, she works at I an ICU in Connecticut and she rarely gets to dance anymore. Um, but when she does, she walks right in and is fabulous. 
Um, you know, I, <laughs> the pregnant woman was really a pregnant woman. Uh, <laughs> the relationship between Rob and the red-headed woman he dances with is not an actual relationship, but most of the characters don't fall far from the characters they are. Um, but I don't know if it's a lack of imagination or brilliant casting. <laughs> Well, I'd like to open it up to anybody here in the audience if you have any questions. For or comments. Or are comments, welcome. yeah. <laughs> comments, questions, thoughts. Well, let's get Jonathan Denny. Okay. <coughs> yes. So Jonathan was my neighbor up the hill on Castle Heights, and um, he, in the last sort of five years, I guess, started paying attention to my dance films and was very positive about them privately and publicly. So I put his mouth to the test and asked if he would help with this. Um, so he looked at it and he said something nice, which I wish I'd written down, like this is a new way of entertaining. Um, and, and then he, so that was, I don't know, May or something. And I did know he was sick. I should have been more aware of how precious his time was. But he did give me some of his precious time, you know, and was amused, I think, and entertained to have something that he could do um, without any la particular labor, which was to sit on his back porch uh, with a laptop between us and make suggestions. Some really tiny, like, don't let the little girl fall down. <laughs> you know, okay, fine, because it, people will worry. Uh, to, to, um, to big, conversations about music with lyrics. Mm -hmm. he, f he found some of them t terminally toxic. <laughs> the man could be tough. And, uh, and I followed his lead and excised some of them and it led me to a, a score that's got fewer words and probably more coherence. Um, what else did he do that was, he helped uh, arrange a screening at Jacob Burns early in the process, I mean with my first full draft, and it was really helpful to see it big and hear it loud. Uh, and he helped connect me to Skip Livesay, who I know, but you know, encouraged me to get to Skip and get a really good sound score. And he didn't see the finished product, and I really regret it. But more, I regret that I um, pushed him to work on my project when he was busy, you know, trying to close his life. But it was his choice, and I th as I say, I think he had some fun. It's probably Joanne I should apologize to. Well, he's so instinctive about these things, too. Like, he can look at something and just immediately kind of nail it. He suggested the, the uh, we have a shared hoot owl. What's, hoot owl? What's it called? Hoot owl. The one that goes, you know, whoo, whoo, whoo. A uh, real one. A real one. I mean, we don't own it, but we hear it from either it's of our houses. Right, right. And he suggested that the hoot owl appear at night when she goes up to watch the mm. pregnant woman dance. And, you know, little things like that were just so right on. What, what I remember is the fly on the wall where they kept saying, too much baby, cut the baby. <laughs> no kidding. Really? Yeah. And she had a lot of babies here, so he was really <laughs> Yes. This is uh, the Dan Daniel, my husband, who is a writer, wrote a great book called The Names of Birds. And in the snow, when we see a book mm. on the bed, it's his book. She has good taste. You know, I, I meant to bring the treatment that I wrote, you know, two Octobers, three Octobers ago. Uh, but I think I kind of stuck to it in, in a most general way. The scenes, I mean, when it would snow, <laughs> when it would snow, I would leap at it. Um, the woods I knew I needed to, to do, the, uh, I don't know, does it have more scenes than most movies? I think maybe the music, I, I think it has a lot more music than most movies, and maybe there's a feeling that the, that the scenes aren't, that the scenes are distinct and don't, it's not like we go back to this place because when you go back to it, there's snow. Or when you go back to it, uh, it's nighttime. Um, there's, a kind of, there's a kind of overlapping of um, 
nature, going to nature, coming back into a room, going to the river, coming back to the room, looking at the sky, back to the room. So there's a lot of flow of in and out and close-ups on feet or close-up, you know, there, there's a very kind of loving um, lyricism to the choice of angles and, the, and, and, and it, it comes across as a kind of seamless editorial uh, that you have all these wonderful elements and how did you pick through them and figure out what you wanted to put where? <laughs> it's mostly sequential. You know, it, it's mostly in the order we shot it, which was the order of the seasons. Again, I wasn't so imaginative, <laughs> you know, it's like you, you'd shoot some stuff in each different season and the first party appears three times throughout. You know, the, and I figured if you know that, it's not a big deal because any party is, that, is a party at her house. But there were, I think, the first party we see them at the table, we see them on the lawn, then we move on. Then we see two people arriving and we see the green, the woman in green on the table. And is there one more party scene? Oh, then they're immediately after that, they're in the house after the party. Um, so those four were shot in one day. I mean, you can't imagine how many, right? So how many things we shot in one day. Uh, the day that that Charles, I remember one day that Charles and I worked, we were in the flamenco studio, in the cemetery, at the house, and then at the beach, all in one day. No crew, no union, hardly any lights, fast. I think when we first started, the only person she knew was Arthur and me. Arthur very closely. Uh, you know, because many months passed, she became, in, and because this is her nature, she became involved with the people that she met at the first party. She, uh, Alicia, the one, she's a very beautiful, green, mixed race, green-eyed person who goes to the house. She met Alethea, I think, during this process, and, and actually Arthur asked her to formally mentor Alethea, who was working at the Bronx Academy of Arts and Dance, which mm -hmm. he runs. Um, she got involved with Esme, uh, the redhead in the green dress, and became a natural mentor to her. Uh, Blakely, the one who dances with Rob, who is a Martha Graham dancer transitioning to a future life. Eileen took an interest in her and is trying to you know, figure out how to score a university job for her. But only one of them was her real mentor. But if you sat with Eileen for long, not in a bossy way, she'd take an interest in you and, and your heart's needs and try and help you find them. Had she ever? She had a tiny bit on screen. And what is the name of the woman? I said I would look it up. Uh, 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 she, I, Eileen came of age in the Judson Church era mm. in New York, mm. and there was a, there's a woman with three names, Latin, still living, uh, a, a, quite a well-known experimental playwright. Fornes. Yes, Irene, Maria Irene Fornes. Who, was, who said that? Jerry. Yeah, th yeah, thank you, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, and she was in a bunch of her plays. I never saw her. Um, so yeah, she has had experience acting. I was noticing, sorry, I was noticing tonight in the scene where she's, you know, on her deathbed essentially, and they're all sitting around her, that these, you know, young people who are not necessarily actors just got into the spirit so beautifully. I mean, we didn't do a whole lot of takes. The whole, to do more takes probably would have actually destroyed their little bit of faith in this story we were telling, but without doing a whole lot, you know, one tears up, one kind of smiles awkwardly, one looks off into space. I didn't direct that. I just said, here's the story. <laughs> well, there is one when we see her looking at her black and white dancing, but yeah. Or a telephone, even. <laughs> and hardly a car. <laughs> Tablecloths. They would put them on the tables before the dinner. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. I don't know, it's, I think it's, I like domestic activities made beautiful. It feels very ritualistic in a way, you know, just kind of setting the table for. And the second, the second one, the sort of lacier one, is the two of them trying to cheer her up. So they're active, the one that before, Chris, at Christmas time, when, mm. you know, she's glum, and the two of them arrive with um, 
I don't know, light and love and cookies and cheer. Uh -huh, the photographer, uh, what's his role? He, he... <laughs> He only was available at rare moments. Uh, in fact, he, he, he was going through his own health issues that year, so he came to the first party, and then it was a long time till I could get him again, and I forced him to come to the last party so that he wouldn't, it wouldn't be his only appearance. But he's that person in the group who can be relied on to be the archivist. Um, and although, he, uh, you know, I, if I had been smarter, I probably would have found a way for him and Eileen, who are the closest in age, to have some different connection than his being the mm. archivist, but mm. I didn't think it through. <laughs> I don't know what to say about it, except that I think the, her response to, the, it's one of the dances they do for her, in a sense. Um, and there are several of those moments where their pleasure is to perform for her delight. Um, I don't think it, I mean, again, it was thrown together pretty quickly and I shot a version of Aislinn doing it in her nurse clothes in the sunlight spring that I sometimes regret that I didn't, I did stick it in once, uh, but then it wasn't really the Aislinn story, so it went out. But I sort of regret that it isn't there because it, um, it does that thing of reminding you that you do know movement and that that all of us recognize movement and when it's shaped, it has its own message, Identity. rhythm, story. Um, but you knew that without me having Aislinn do it in the spring. I think we have time for one more and Samuel? Yeah, no, I, you know, it's way easier to make short films. Um, it's a different, you know, it's a different experience to screen them because they're short and then something else follows it. So there's not the same shared time with an audience um, when it's completed. Shooting it is, I mean, I, I've shot one shot and completed and it's already in festivals, one short since this. And I was just in Brazil making something that's probably gonna be several little shorts or a kinda long one. Mm -hmm. But I'm not eager to do a feature again Period. They're mostly on Vimeo. If you um, <clears throat> want to reach me through, you know, all the means you can, marta.renzi at gmail.com. And there's one that's password protected. I'll gladly send it to you. But when they're new, I try and kind of keep them to myself till they're out and about for a while. But yeah, there, if you go, you know, all know how to get to Vimeo or Google me and it will take you to Vimeo. And you can see lots of them. They're quite different each from each other, though I guess there is a signature Renzi thing. Um, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a great pleasure to make them. It's even more of a pleasure to share them. Um, what are the plans for this one? It's screening rarely. The next one is in Borrego Springs, um, California, which looks like kind of an adorable festival that's only five years old, uh, and that's in a desert community that's called a, what do you call it when, the, uh, I read that it's uh, one of the places where they're trying to keep light, like we could go see the stars well tonight, a limited light community or something like that, which I think is kind of a great place to show this. Yeah. Um, it just showed in Brazil where I was to a select audience. Um, if you have any place you think, I think it should show to teachers, especially, you know, ones who feel themselves to be mentors, and uh, to old people who can handle it. <laughs> uh, so if you know places to share that, let me know, because I don't need to get paid anything. I don't. I don't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.